We're in week number two of our series, as we said a minute ago, Spirit Filled. So I'm excited about bringing a word uh, to you this morning as we continue on in this idea. And I just, I, I was thinking this while ago that I had this conviction that uh, as I was, I was sitting in there worshiping and I was thinking about what we were singing about and singing about the Holy Spirit and singing about, you know, we need a fresh wind and all of those things. And one of the things that I thought about is this, you know, God is everywhere, right? And so last week we talked about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, right? So there's nowhere you can go that God is not. And so what do we mean when we're singing, God, we need more of you? Well, God is everywhere. We have to understand not just the omnipresence of God, but you have to understand the manifest presence of God, the made known presence of God, where we say, God, we, we want you to come upon us in a fresh way. And when it comes to the manifest presence of God, the made known presence of God that, that we experience where it's tangible and it's powerful, what I've learned about the tangible presence of God, that, that manifest presence, is that God comes where he's wanted where he's desired. And so my prayer is this as a church, we would always desire God's presence in our services, that we would desire the Holy Spirit to move in a fresh way, that we wouldn't just put God in our neat little box and say, okay, God, only move like I've seen you move. But you know what? I wanna see God do things that I've never seen him do before. I'd love to see with my own eyes, blinded eyes being open. I'd love to see miracles like I read about in the Bible. Oh, I've seen God do a few things, but I'd love to see more of it. I'd love to experience them in fresh ways. And so what we were singing about and what we were talking about a while ago, that, that's what we were saying. So I always feel an obligation as your pastor to teach you in moments like this where we're saying, God, we need more of you. What are we actually saying? And so that's what we were saying. God, we need more of your presence. Would you make yourself known amongst your people in fresh ways? And honestly, that's what this sermon series is all about, Spirit Filled. It's based on this passage of scripture, and I'll pray for you here in a second, that I found in Acts 13, 52, and the disciples disciples were full of joy and what? And the Holy Spirit. They were full of joy, they were filled with it, and the Holy Spirit. Our theme this year as a church is the year of great joy. Well, I want our church to have great joy, but I also want us to be full and filled, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. They had both. You know, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And so when you have the Holy Spirit, you'll have joy. Maybe the joy that you're missing in your life, the peace that you're missing in your life, the thing that you're desiring may be a byproduct of you saying, Holy Spirit, I need more of you in my life. You want more joy? I promise you, ask for more of the Holy Spirit and watch it come. Watch it come. Amen? All right, like two of you received that. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray that you would use my words today, but they would not just be my words, but your word, and it would be living and active. It would be sharper than any double-edged sword, and it would do exactly what it needs to do today. It would speak to our hearts in a fresh way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today I want to talk about, in week number two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you have a theology on that or a doctrine on that, uh, but I want to talk today, you know, uh, scholars would refer to this as pneumatology. I want to talk about kind of the pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit today and what it specifically means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Last week I talked about who is the Holy Spirit. Today I want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the primary purpose of that baptism of the Holy Spirit, which by the way, I'll just go ahead and tell you up front, it is power. It is power in the life of a believer. Next week, I'm going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And then last week, I'm going to talk about a living water that's ready to flow through you in an unstoppable way. But here's the thing. Our churches need power. You know, it's been said recently that over 1.2 million people will walk out on the faith this year. That's a startling statistic. Now, when you think of the billions of people across planet Earth, you may think, well, that's not any big deal. Well, it's a big deal if 1.2 million people are walking away from the faith. And here has what has been said, that one of, the most, uh, one, of, one of the biggest reasons that they are walking away from the faith is this, that the church is just not compelling enough. 
compelling enough. And here's what I think that means, because in, 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 a, in a world that is full of information and in a world that is full of, you know, we can Google every fact that we want to have about God. It is not our preaching isn't good enough. It is not people aren't deep enough. I don't think it's our theology as churches. What I think it is in the Western context, and you don't see this really in the Eastern context when you read about the church as a whole, but I think the reason why they would say it's just not compelling enough is this. I just, I, I, it doesn't, I, I there, there's, there's a searching for a feeling that they're not getting. And I think it's because many times our churches are void of power. You're telling me about a God that can do this, but I'm not experiencing it. And so I think our church needs practice, but it also needs power. In fact, when I look at the book of Acts and when I look at the New Testament, I see the practices of the church were actually a result of the power that was given to the church. And so our church has to get back to the point where we value the presence of God and the power of God because this is not, here, here's the thing, when we think of God, he is a supernatural God that wants to do supernatural things. And you may not amen that, but if you were sick right now and you had cancer in your body, you would be praying for a supernatural God to touch you. When your marriage is on the rocks and you don't know what to do, you need a supernatural God to heal your marriage, to bring you joy, to touch you. And so we don't like the idea always about a supernatural God because he doesn't fit in our neat, tiny little box sometimes. But the idea is this, that his ways are much higher than our ways, that what he wants to do, we may not be able to describe and fully articulate that there are some times that God may do things that go beyond our thinking, beyond our concept. So I believe we serve a God that is powerful, that is not just omniscient, as we talked about last year or last week, but, but omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. And so we serve an all-powerful, all-knowing God. Here's what A.W. Tozer said. He's a famous pastor of the early years, and he says this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, I believe 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, he said 95% of what they did would stop because everyone would know the difference. And so we've got to get to that. We need the church as a whole to understand this, that what separated the New Testament church, what, what birthed the New Testament church was power and practice. I understand the practices of Acts chapter 2 when they sold all their possessions and they begin to meet and they begin to teach the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and do life together and all of that stuff. But let's not forget about the first 46 verses where the power of the Lord came upon them and enabled them to fulfill everything that Christ told them to fulfill. I just think people need an experience with God now more than ever. And I would say you need an experience with God now than, more than ever. It's one thing to know about God. It's another thing to experience God. And I want you to know we serve a God that does want to be experienced. He doesn't just want you to know about him. He wants you to experience him. And if you don't believe that, just look at stories all throughout the Bible where people didn't just know about God, but they had encounters with God. They had moments where they experienced God. They had burning bush moments and Red Sea parting moments and shadows healing people as they walked by. They experienced God. And so I think one of the best ways for us to understand this idea of experiencing the Holy Spirit is to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's what I want you to do. I would love for you to get some notes out because I want to teach you because where I'm going in a couple weeks where I really want you to, to not take a note at all, if you don't take a note today, you may be closed off later. All right, there are some things that God wants to do in your life that I think you gotta have a foundation for and you gotta understand. So I'm gonna do my best today. I'm not a theologian, but to teach you, all right? Teach you some pneumatology, teach you some understanding when it comes to the Holy Spirit and specifically the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you missed last week, last week we talked about who is the Holy Spirit. Now the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you read in scripture about it, you see it really in two different places and you see it in two different ways, two different meanings. You see the Apostle Paul discussing this idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then you see in the Gospels on four different occasions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. So I wanna tell you what it is and I want to tell you why it's important, because if you're like, I don't even know what that is, so bring it on. 
Let's do it, all right? So here's Paul. The apostle Paul, when he talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he was referring to salvation, where the Holy Spirit lives in you, or last week I talked about this, and dwells within you, all right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13, we see this. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we share the same spirit. Here's what you have to know about Paul's writings on the Holy Spirit in this occasion when he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes us or unites us into Christ. All right, the Holy Spirit drew you into a relationship with God, and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. And Christ comes and lives on the inside of you the moment that you're reborn. This idea of being, being rebirthed is the idea that we see uh, in Nicodemus's life, where he says, how can I be born again? You must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. And he's, you know, this whole conversation, which I won't go into today, but you can read about, and then you see all the teachings throughout Paul's writing in the New Testament testament about how we are made new in Christ and we have a new nature and the idea is this it's the idea of regeneration regeneration all right what is regeneration it is the moment where you become spiritually reborn and at that moment the holy spirit takes residence resides in you. That's what we talked about last week, giving you new life in Christ. And so here is your old life, you are dead, you are dry, you are empty, you are hopeless without Christ. And if I had another cup that was a different color, I just chunked this one away, but for the sake of one cup, all right? And then in Christ, regeneration, new birth, you become a new creation, and you are filled full, everything you need for salvation. You're going to heaven. The Holy Spirit's living inside of you. Your cup is full. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I've come to give you life, but I've also come to give you life to the full. I don't want you to just live full, but I want you to live overflowing. And so we have to understand the overflowing part of it. At regeneration, at rebirth, you are full. You are going to heaven. You have a new nature. The apostle Paul says this. He says, in that moment, anyone that is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. When you give your life to Christ, you have to understand you are a new person. You have a new nature. You awaken the spiritual part of you, and you begin to live that spiritual life, and the Holy Spirit indwells within you. And so that is the baptism that we see Paul talking about in this moment, and it is so important because in a world that sometimes wants to push against the power of the Holy Spirit and this second baptism that many people think is only for the Pentecostal church, which is not. But I will say the reason why the Pentecostal movement has seen so much, so much just, just steam in, in the last century is because people want to experience the power of God. People, people need to know that there's got to be more than what I have because what I'm getting is not working and I need the power of God in my life because I need the power of God in my marriage. I need the power of God in my witnessing. I need the power of God, you know, in my coming and going. And so Pentecostalism across the globe has actually really taken off because people are hungry for encountering God. And I would say that's the same thing that they were hungry for in Acts chapter 2. When they were staying and praying and waiting, probably singing the Hillsong song, We Need a Fresh Wind, what we were just singing a while ago, right? And so in the Gospels, though, we see another form of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I want to I land on today. One was for regeneration, and really the other one is the idea of empowerment, all right? Empowerment. So in the Gospels, the spirit baptism, so in Paul's writing... This baptism where the spirit indwells within you in the gospels when Jesus is, is speaking or being spoken about, it speaks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that will come upon you. So you have to understand in you and upon you, all right, two very different things that these writers were discussing. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I want to talk about is a subsequent event to regeneration, a subsequent event to your rebirth or a secondary experience that is after salvation. You do not need this to go to heaven, all right? But it is the thing that enables you to bring heaven to earth, and you need it. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me show it to you 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, same story. And just in case, you need to hear it because just in case you're like, one of those writers got it wrong. I don't think they really meant it. Well, every writer says the same thing, all right? So let me give you in just in the gospel this, this you know, synoptic structure here of Matthew 3 where it says this. And this is John speaking, John the Baptist. He's speaking of Jesus and he's there with this crowd of people and he's saying, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one is coming after me that is way more powerful than I am. The power resided in him. Whom sandals I'm not even worthy to carry, and he will baptize you. Now, this word baptize is the word baptizo. You remember that a couple weeks ago where we talked about being baptized in water? Same word here. He will baptizo you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Remember last week, the Holy Spirit is like oil, like a dove, like fire. He's not fire, he's not oil, but he's like it. And he said, the Holy Spirit will baptize you and or you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Look at Mark. Mark says this, John saying, I baptize you with water, but Jesus will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit. Luke, we go on, we just... Keep seeing it again. The people were waiting expectantly. All those were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And he's like, that is not me. I am not the Messiah. And John answered them, said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming, more powerful. I mean, they're all hearing the same thing. They're all recording the same thing here. More powerful than me. I can't even, I'm not even worthy to unstrap his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and guess what? John says it too. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down. From heaven as a dove. It is like a dove. It is like fire. It is like oil. But it is the Spirit and it came upon him. Even Jesus baptized in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Would you agree with me that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit? Of course. But here we see him also being baptized with the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit comes upon him. The Holy Spirit came upon him and remained on him. Myself did not know him, but there was one that sent me to baptize with water, told me the man whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on is the one that will baptize you as well with the Holy Spirit. And so we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit all throughout the Gospels, and the, and the key idea that you, I want you to understand when it comes to what the writer's talking about here is this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let me give you three points on it today. Number one is this, that it is immersive. It is immersive. What does the word baptize mean? Again, it means to immerse. Everybody agreed with me last week when we talked about, you know, a couple weeks ago when we talked about being baptized in water. Same word here, baptizo meaning to immerse. David Geisick of Enduring Word, just a commentary writer, says this, the Holy Spirit's outpouring was promised as part of the new covenant. We were promised an immersion, an overflowing of the Spirit in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Just as baptism in water completely immerses us, the baptism of the Holy Spirit completely saturates every part of us. Our language, our thoughts, our actions, our deeds are coming and going. All right, and so just to help you understand it, remember, you've got everything you need. You are filled. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, all right? So regeneration in Christ, you've got all you need, full. John says there's one coming, though, that he will baptize you, immerse you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Who's, nobody's in the splash zone. They must have knew it was coming, <laughs> except for me. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? Remember, immersion, baptize you. That's why I'd say, where can I go? I can't go anywhere. You're all around me. You're upon me. You're in me. The Holy Spirit immerses us. I came to give you life, but life to the full. Completely filled, completely satisfied, completely immersed, immersed. 
And so number one is you have to understand what the gospels we're referring to is this, immersion, saturation, having the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's in you, but it also is going to be upon you, but it's going to be upon you for a reason because he immersed them. The reason why they needed to be completely saturated, it didn't need to just be in them, but upon them is because the Holy Spirit was there to immerse them so it could empower them, empower them. The idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is empowerment, empowerment. It is not just the gifts of the Spirit. It is not just, it was the gifts of the Spirit so that you could be empowered to do the work of the Spirit. Next week, I'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and every one of them are given to you to perform Christ-like exalted ministry in the earth. So that ultimately the gospel could be advanced, not for yourself. There is one gift he gave to you for yourself to edify yourself. That'll be in week number four. I want you to see it. In Acts chapter one, but you will receive power, dunamis, dynamite power, explosive power. That's the word, power. When the Holy Spirit, what? Comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to understand this moment here. A couple chapters later, Jesus, all right, he had just been resurrected, all right? He had died on a cross, been buried in a tomb, resurrected. He goes to the disciples, and guess what? They are timid and in fear. And he walks in the door. He's like, hey, guys, it's me. Don't be afraid anymore. And the Bible says that he breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. And most commentators would liken that to Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, where the Spirit of God breathed into man, and they became a living human being, right? Regeneration. It was, in many ways, their rebirth moment. It was their salvation moment, in many ways, where the Holy Spirit came and lived in them. So if that was enough, why did it need to come upon them if it was already in them? Again, because there was a second work that Jesus was talking about that was going to empower them at another level. He said in Matthew, right before he left, he said, and you guys know this, it's a great commission. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, preaching and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. I'm with you. And I'm sure they were like, how in the world am I going to do that? I mean, think about Peter just a few moments, you know, like ago in the story. You know what Peter was doing? I mean, he'd been with Jesus, walked with Jesus. You would think he's a pretty strong dude, cut somebody's ear off for Jesus. But then he's timid and shy and in fear and denying Christ to a little child. You want me to do what? Go into all the, huh? No way, don't you know? I, I mean, like, this ain't happening. I'm the denier. I'm the guy that, like, sold you out. Not only that, when Jesus comes and breathes on them, they're full of fear. So here you have a, a group of people that their, their nature is not to live this out, because this is scary. Yeah. This has consequences. This can lead to death. And so he says, yeah, yeah, I want you to go make disciples. But he said, don't worry about it because I'm gonna send you a power. I'm sending you the promise that my father, okay, upon you. The promise of what? The Holy Spirit. So I need you to stay in the city. So I need you to stay in Jerusalem And I need you to wait until you are clothed with power from on high. So stay in the city until you're clothed. Remember, he's like oil. He's like fire. He's like till you're clothed. The idea, not just in you, upon you, clothed, immersed, saturated, clothed with power on on high. So on one occasion... While they were eating with them, he said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift. Remember last week, we described the Holy Spirit as a gift that my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days, and now here he is. It's all coming to fulfillment. 
Remember in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's going to baptize you with fire. And here Jesus is saying, I'm going to baptize you with the thing that everyone's been telling you is coming. The thing that I talked about in John 14, 15, and 16, the advocate that was coming, there is a power now that is far greater that is going to come upon you. And so wait till I baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If they already had the Holy Spirit, why did they need this? Because they needed the power. They needed the power to do what they needed to do. And so in essence, what was happening here is Jesus is saying, you cannot go until you stay. I need you to wait because you're right. You don't have what you need. So I'm sending you, but wait before you go. Wait for the thing I want to give you. And so here it comes. Acts chapter two. When the day of Pentecost was fully, or when the day of Pentecost came and they were all together in one place, suddenly a sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They had what uh, seemed to be cloven tongues of fire, like fire, remember, separated and came to rest upon each one of them. It rested on them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I want you to see what John Piper says, a non-Pentecostal, about the Holy Spirit and about this scripture. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's a pastor um, that, that many of, of you guys maybe have followed, Desiring God Ministries. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a moment where a believer received extraordinary spiritual power for Christ's exalting ministry. So what did the Holy Spirit do in that moment? Well, the Holy Spirit, when it came upon them, it provided them with supernatural enablement to be witnesses, to teach and preach with power, to advance the kingdom of God. And you've got to know that the power that the Holy Spirit wants to give, it is not just for this stage. It is not just for me or the worship leaders, but it is for you for boldness, to be witnesses he said, I'm going to give you a power so you can do, fulfill the great commission in your workplace, in your home, wherever you go. And so here's my question for you as a believer. Whose power are you living in? Have you asked, Holy Spirit, baptize me with your power? Fill me. I know I'm going to heaven, but I can't do what you've called me to do. And you know that. Because you've been there. You've been in a moment and you've thought, I just don't have what it takes. I know what he's asking me to do, but I'm timid and I'm scared and I'm fearful. And I don't think I can bring somebody else. But Moses, when he says, like, I can't go, who am I? Begin to make all the excuses. When the Old Testament, we had the power of God external. But now in the New Testament, the New Covenant, now it's internal. Not just in you, but it can be all over you. So whose power are you living in? I believe that there's a lot of times as Christians, and this isn't like a call out, this is a call up. We're trying to live a supernatural life without supernatural empowerment. It is very hard to do the things of God that you see in the Bible without being spiritually empowered. How is it they walked by people and their shadows healed people? How is it they prayed for the sick and they were healed? It was the power of God that came upon them. And so you have timid, weak, fearful disciples hiding, worried, fearful. And then you have Peter, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, stand up, preach the message to the early church, and then ultimately live his life and go down as somebody that lived for Christ in such a way that history says that he was actually crucified upside down. How do you go from denying Christ to being crucified upside down for Christ? Because he said, I'm not even worthy to be crucified the same way as my Savior. Holy Spirit came upon him and empowered him. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is for empowerment and it is for you. And it is something that you can ask for in faith. But it's not just a one-time experience. It's something you can continually ask for. The Holy Spirit baptism is a continual experience. 
John 5.18 says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Uh, There's some people this weekend at Bourbon Beyond, I think, probably living that out. (laughs) Oh, y'all heard about that too. (laughs) Instead, be filled. This idea, be filled, if you look up this word in the Greek, filled, is the idea of continual. Be filled continually. Continually. Meaning, be filled is not a single event. So in Acts chapter four, we see Peter and John, they had just been arrested in prison and they get out and they're having a prayer meeting and they're praying. And the same individuals that were filled in Acts chapter two, guess what, are filled again. And after they had prayed, they came to the place, the whole place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly, meaning Pentecost wasn't a one-time event. And so why is this important? Because we leak. We leak, meaning um, life sometimes can suck the life out of you. Have you ever felt like, man, I was really strong last week, but this week I had all this stuff happen and I just don't feel God's power like I need to. You may not understand that, but you get that because you've said something like that before. Like, I just, just feel like I'm lacking right now. What your spirit is crying out to is just saying, well, God, I need more of you. And so you hear people in the church say things like this. Give me a fresh baptism. Give me a fresh anointing. Give me a fresh outpouring. And that's what I want our church to live in in this, this like daily, like, God, give me a fresh anointing. Give me a fresh baptism. Give me a fresh of your, you know, your spirit. Man, I just, I don't want a Sunday to go by where I don't stand back in my office before I take the stage and say, God, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. And so fill me though afresh again. They don't need last Sunday's power. They need this Sunday's. So every day you can wake up and say, Holy Spirit, fill me again. If I'm if I'm if I'm leaking at all a little bit, if if my cup's just been kind of raising above the tide here, you know, just like just give me a little, fill me again, you know? How do you receive it? I'll end here. I need to wrap up. I'll close you out. How do you receive it? Well, I think you just ask in faith. Same way you ask for salvation, you ask in faith for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just just fill me with your power. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Just ask for it. I need your power in my life. And then surrender to God. Surrender in a way where even if it doesn't make sense, God, I'll take all of you I can get. I don't have to understand everything about you to want an experience with you. We've got to get out of our Western mind and we've got to be more open to encountering the presence of God. But many times pride keeps us from it. D.L. Moody said this, I firmly believe the moment our hearts are empty to pride and selfishness and ambition and everything on the contrary to God's law, The Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if our hearts are full of pride and conceit and ambition in the world, there's no room for the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. So we must be emptied before we can be filled. We've got to be emptied of the things that push God away. We've got to be saying, God, here's all my pride. Here's all my just, I repent. That's why repentance, which we talked about a few weeks ago, all this has been building on this, guys. If we don't repent, we're going to be so full of the world that there's no room for the Spirit's power. So we repent, and then we receive, and then we wait with expectation. And I have found that God doesn't make me wait long. But there are some moments where I do wrestle a little bit with God. Say, God, I can't go unless you come with me. So I need your power. They didn't leave Jerusalem, but they waited for the gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. So today, my prayer is for you to receive it. You receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you feel like, you know what, I have been doing, I have been doing my walk with God void of His power. Meaning I have the Holy Spirit in my life, but I have not activated it. I want to give you a moment to just activate that in your life. To say, Holy Spirit, baptize me. 
What are you saying? You're just saying, immerse me. Immerse me with the fullness of your spirit. What you were to the 12, what you were on the day of Pentecost, what you were there in Acts chapter four, what John talked about, that fire, may you put the fire inside of me and it may it just, may it be like the writer said, it was like a fire shut up in my bones. So if you're in here today, you would say, that's me. I, I want the Holy Spirit like that in my life. I feel like I'm living in my own power. I wanna invite you, just like I was gonna hand you a gift, to right there in your seat, open up your hands. If that's you, you would say, I want that. I want the power of God in a fresh way in my life. I want everything that's available to me. Last service I said that and I saw a whole row close their hands off and just cross their arms. The truth is you don't, you don't have, you're going to heaven. But you're missing out. This is a part of the Christian walk that you're missing out on. And you can receive it. You can ask for it in faith. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh today. So God, I pray with every person right now, any person that, that's hands are opened up in front of you right now, may you clothe them with power. May your Holy Spirit fall afresh on them. May you baptize us with your spirit. And I pray that there would be a hunger in our church to continually, continually desire to be full of the spirit and power of God. May the power that is in us be used to preach and teach and exalt you in this earth. In Jesus' name.